Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. You know, um, in life we have a lot of opportunities to make decisions. And um, over 25 years of pastoring this church, I've talked about this a lot. Um, You know, one of the things in our area, I'm really, you know, pretty much the nation and the world too, is when, when people think of God, they really think, you know, um, you know, I, I sing that song in Spanish, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see as old Doris Day. Some of you are way too young uh, to know that. And, uh, but the truth is, um, it's really one of the biggest traps that the devil can ever do or give someone or lead them to believe is it really doesn't matter. God's got everything under control and you have nothing to do. Now, see, when I say that, that makes some of you in here nervous because you've heard people say, well, God, isn't God in control? Well, God is a sovereign God and he's God and he's in control uh, and he, he is in control. And yet he gave the earth to men and the men messed it up. And then a man, Christ Jesus, had to come back and turn it right side up again. And now it's available right side up again to everybody who believes. But one of the things the devil does is he still likes to feed into believers is you really don't have any control. And people who really believe that and espouse things like that, they'll say, well, I just believe that whatever's meant to be will be. If the, you know, and we can use it like in healing. Well, I just believe if the Lord wants to heal me, he'll heal me. Well, that's not New Testament truth. I believe if the Lord wants to prosper me, he'll just prosper me. That's not really New Testament truth. Um, I believe that, you know, if I'm supposed to get married, he or she will just appear, you know, at the right time, at the right place. Well, that's not exactly true because God has given us a free will and you have a lot to do. And a lot of times when something goes bad, the first, when you believe that, then people do what? And I'm helping you because I want you to help some people. Because it is just a, it's a terrible trap to be in, to be religiously taught and not New Testament taught. And what happens is that people just then, they get to this place of it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't really matter what I believe because God's it's, it's all under God's control. But really, um, that's not really true. Um, God is a sovereign God. And he's limited his sovereignty to the word. And if you believe that he's a sovereign God and you speak his word, he'll sovereignly be able to come in and move things that nobody else can move and nobody else can do. He'll do that for you. In other words, he can change things sovereignly because you speak the word of God and and that word sovereignly goes in and it messes with stuff that can't be changed any other way. He's a good God. But you and I have to understand that a lot of things that we uh, do have, have a lot of implication on our future, on our children's future, and it's called decisions. And so when I, uh, you know, all day long, that's all the word I keep hearing besides that first word of knowledge that I got is I keep hearing decisions. Now, how many of you know there's some decisions? We make decisions all day long. Y'all made a decision. You made a really good one to come to church. But it was a decision. Don't lift your hand if you've ever decided not to. You decided, most of you, to go to work this morning. And sometimes it's just a, yeah, I'm going to do it. I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. If you're married, sometimes you have to choose to love one another. If you got children, <laughs> sometimes you have to choose to think, I made them, and they're going to be all right. Um, so a lot of times when people don't realize that, because it's very religious to believe 
well, whatever will be, will be. God's got everything under control. But really, if that's the truth, there's really no need to ever pray. There's no need for faith. There's no need for your authority. And really, then, there's just no reason for us to gather together. Let's just all go home. Turn on the TV. Watch all the crazy stuff going on. Just forget about it. But that's really, the, that's really wrong. <laughs> Amen? And you and I know that. Now, how do you help somebody who doesn't know that? Well, you've got to figure out and let the Spirit of God help you to help them. There's things you can do. There's things you can say. Uh, you know, if somebody's, uh, you know, believing or they're having trouble, you can pray with them. You can agree with them. You can speak the word to them. You can help them. But when I uh, was when I got up this morning, just just meditating the word decision, decisions. Again, you and I make decisions all day long. Some of them seem inconsequential. Some of them could be big. Like big decisions come with who you're going to marry. If you're in high school, where you're going to go to college. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're a career person, uh, you know, especially around here, if you're an engineer, I mean, I think you can have a different job every two weeks, um, you know, work for a different company. Um, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to keep up with some of y'all. Um, but the truth is you should know when you make those decisions, what you're going to do. In other words, I've seen people in this area, uh, make, uh, I've, I've seen people get really um, out of the will of God, not putting everything under the lordship of Jesus when it comes to making decisions in life. And so I just want to remind some of you of some things. And some of you, I might be, you might be hearing this for the first time. But for most of you, this is going to be a reminder. And I feel really strong about this reminder. And so we're going to go to James chapter 4 verse number 13, James chapter 4, verse number 13. Y'all with me? Y'all here? Ready to get it? Because I believe this is real important, even if this is for one person in this room tonight. I believe the Lord, you know, because there were some other things that I wanted to do uh, that, I, you know, are just looking to see what else to do, but this kept coming up. Decisions. Decisions. Decisions, because uh, understanding that everything is not up to God, that uh, there are some things that are up to us. Let me say it this way. One of my favorite preachers says it this way. We don't have a no-fault Christianity. In other words, what a lot of Christians want is when something goes wrong, then we can always look upward or downward. In other words, it's never me. But the truth of the matter is that you and I are the ones making decisions in our life. And, and what's going on in our life has to do with the sum total of all the decisions we make. And sometimes we're making daily decisions that will affect our life in a negative or a positive way. But then there's also those big decisions. So I'm not just talking about the big decisions in life about where you should work, who you should marry. But there are also some things daily that we choose that are very important. And so I want to remind you of these things. It says in James chapter 4 verse 13, Go to now you that say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city, continue there a year, buy and sell and get gain. So in verse 13, it's talking to basically an entrepreneur, a business person that's saying, you know what? Um, I'm going to decide which city I'm going to live in and I'm going to take my business there and that's what I'm going to do. And then the Lord replies, whereas you know not what is on the morrow. How many is true that you and I don't know what tomorrow holds? You don't. There's no way to know in the natural what tomorrow holds. One of the mistakes we make is we think that everything is constant, everything's okay, nothing could, especially us as Americans, we think everything, you know, it's always going to be this way, it's always this. Now, you, it's different for you and I as believers, and I'm not, but I'm not talking about that. But right now the Lord is answering back and he's saying, well, you can't say I'm going to go to this city and buy and sell and get gain for a year because you don't know what tomorrow is. For what is your life? How I many it's true? It's a vapor. Now, y'all, this is not a funeral scripture. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears a little time and vanishes away. How many of you know if you lived 120 years, that's a vapor to God? 
And he's trying to help us out. Verse 15. Verse 15 says this. For what you ought to say. So, so, because in verse 13 he's saying, you said this. This is your intention. I'm telling you why you shouldn't have said that. Now I'm going to tell you what you should say. What you ought to say, if the Lord will. Now, in our circles, we just, oh my gosh, we can't say if the Lord will. That is, that is just, oh my gosh, you can't say that. Don't say if the Lord will. Well, it's, this one's different because you don't know the will of the Lord. How many know faith begins where the will of the Lord is known? Now, when it's written down, you know the will of the Lord, don't you? Is it the will of God for everybody to be saved? How could you know that? Because it's written down. It's the will of God that everybody be healed. How could you know that? Because 1 Peter 2, 24, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Matthew 8, 17, Isaiah, tell, right? It's written down. Everybody say it's written down. Uh, God wants to bless your socks off and give you lots of socks, right? How do you know that? Because it's written down. Not about the socks. It's written down that God wants to bless you, right? How do we know it? It's written down. So that is the will of God. But when it comes to your personal life, there is nothing written down. There's nothing written down. I mean, as far as who you should marry, where you should work, where you should live, how many children you should have, all that kind of stuff, who you should root for in football. I mean, none of that's written down. You've got to figure out that stuff for yourself with much prayer. Hallelujah. Right? You've got to know. So how do you, we're going to get to how you know. But God is responding back. He said, what you ought to say, verse 15, what you ought to say, if the Lord will will live, what, where is he talking? He's not talking about staying alive there. Are you with me? That's not talking about staying alive. I know that's the way you've heard it, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about sit, where, what city you're going to live in. He's not talking about staying alive. Because he's answering verse 13. You said this, we're going to live and do this or that. And he said... You know, what is now I can see if you tied it only to verse 14 when it's talking about maybe the expanse of your life, but it's not because he said what you ought to say. You said, verse 13, now what you ought to say, if the Lord will, will live and do this or do that. Because you said you were going to do this or do that, but you didn't check in with headquarters to find out what you'd be doing. And you just said we're going to do this. I, I, I know people, I've watched people that make decisions not based on the will of the Lord, but on good circumstances. In other words, I've watched people uh, root, uh, take our family and move them because they got a raise or a promotion. That's the wrong reason to move. You should never move because you get a raise. Now, you know, you pray. Now, let me say that. I moved here because I got a raise and I like it. Well, it's, and, I, and I'm glad. But the truth of the matter is, I, hopefully, you would have prayed and asked the Lord. And if you had peace, then you followed that peace. That's the step. Because uh, money should not lead you. That makes you money-minded. A, a promotion or a title shouldn't lead you because that makes you proud. So, and, and you don't know what the future holds because just because you made $20,000 more a year and your three children went nuts after you moved, is that $20,000 going to fix that? It's not. So you and I have to know these things. Now, when it comes to everything, everybody say decisions. This is a little heavy on Wednesday night, but you're a Wednesday night folks and you can handle it. For what you ought to say, if the Lord wills, will live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, and such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not to him, that it's sin. So um, how many of you know we all have to make decisions? And so the Bible is full about talking Deuteronomy 30, 19. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth a record this day against you. I set before you life to death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That, you, that, that both you and your seed, what? You and your seed. So the decisions you and I make have not only to do with me, have not only to do with me, the parent, but it has to do with my child. So every decision we make, every decision your parents make, they did affect you. Now, we all don't need counseling because of it, all right? 
If I hear one more time, I'm a, I came from a dysfunctional family. Well, welcome to America. <laughs> you know, come on. Um, you know, parents do the best they can, you know, from gener- generation to generation. Uh, you know, if you do better than those before you, you do better. You just keep doing better. Amen. Well, what I've noticed in, in ministering to people and counseling people is usually one generation swings from one thing to the next. Like if one generation was overprotective, the next one will be loose as a goose. <laughs> because as a child, they felt, they felt helicoptered. And so they're not going to helicopter their children. Lord, help my grandchildren. Anyway, so, uh, 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 so, so, but you know, the truth is, um, in a, y'all laughing, but it's, it's really, you watch, if you look at it, just swing. So you guys got to have the Holy Ghost help. Amen. So the truth is, though, that God wants us to understand we have to choose. Everybody say choose. choose. And we're choosing every day. He said, well, Pastor Mark, I really made some bad choices. Well, thank God that he can deliver you out of all your troubles. But if we're looking at it, this is kind of a preemptive strike tonight. Because if I can remind you, and that's really what I feel I'm doing, and I'm talking to, even if it's one person individually, you're about to make a big decision. I want to show you how to do it scripturally. So, because if we, if we make good decisions on the front end, we don't have to pray for miracles all the time. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. But if you and I get to the place, one time the Lord spoke to me and he said, if you'll just teach your people, talking about y'all, just to do the word, we're going to get to it. But if if they'll just do the written word, I won't have to talk to them so much. Now he wants to talk to you, but wouldn't it be nice just to have a conversation with the Lord about the weather and about, you know, just nice, instead of him always trying to having to get you out of a mess all the time. What will keep that from happening? You being a doer of the word. You and I do what's written down. You and I using our faith and and, and being doers of the word of God. But and, and, And then every decision we make in life, we're weighing it against the written word. We're weighing it against the written word. Now we're going to get into this. So everybody say choose. And then Hebrews 11, 25, talking about Moses, said he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So even in things in life, when, um, you know, how many of you know all of us, I'm taking a little side thought here, but all of us, uh, uh, your body did not get saved. You're, you're putting it under though, Right. And some of some people have you know different things going on. Different you know you can't look at somebody and say, well, I don't know why they have a problem with that. Well, you don't have their flesh, you don't have their history, you don't know what you don't know why. But I do know this: all of us can live free. All of us can be no longer shackled. All of us can be free, and it's just a choice. So, so here we see that he chose to suffer. I mean, you know, sometimes putting your body under is suffering, but he chose to suffer with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin. That's for a season. In other words, that season was going to come to an end, but he chose to do the hard thing. My wife says it like this. She says short-term pain will produce a long-term gain. In other words, short-term walking in love with somebody that you'd rather slap is better for you Learning how to walk in love, learning how to walk in forgiveness, uh, it's better for you. It's better for your health. It's better for everything. It, it's just better. Um, Any time that you can, you know, um, not take a shortcut. Anybody glad? Now listen, anybody glad Jesus didn't take a shortcut? Because he could have. In the temptation, the devil said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give this to you. But then he would have still been under He went, he rejoiced to go to the cross the hard way. He made a choice so that you and I could be free, so that you and I could rule and reign today. He made a choice. Make no mistake about it. He could have called. He made a choice. While they were plaiting that crown of thorns, pushing it on his head and and making fun of him and spitting on him and telling him to prophesy. Now make no mistake about it. He, all man and all God, but all man made a choice. He, He showed us how to make choices and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. 
Sometimes it's easier just to do, you know, because some choices nobody's watching except God and the devil. But sometimes we may have to make hard choices. Um, I love this scripture. I use it quite a bit. Hebrews chapter 12, 16 through 17. But I look out, I look at it in the message because I just think it's just the most fun way to look at it. Hebrews 12, 16 through 17. Y'all remember Esau? He was hungry. And what did he do? Watch out for the Esau, I love the way it says it, syndrome. Trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. In other words, he made a choice. My birthright is worth nothing. Um, that, that food looks really good, and I'm real hungry. You think, well, why would a man give away his birthright? It's because he despised it. He didn't think anything of it. I mean, you know, you and I have got rights, and we've got privileges in God, and we don't want to do anything that will shut those off. Amen? Amen? Watch out for the Esau syndrome. God's trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You will know how Esau later regretted. Regretted what? That decision. That impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But by then it was too late. Tears or no tears. Now I will say this. Aren't you glad that most of the time it's not too late? Most of the time it's not too late. But in this case it was too late. You can cry all you want. It, you know, the train has left the station. You can't. You, there, you can't get on that one. And for him, you know, um, he got some blessing uh, later on, but even that wasn't God's highest and best. And I, I think the truth, what I'm trying to get to you is the choices you and I make, and I want to help somebody because if you're getting ready to make a big decision, you got to know how to do it God's way. And maybe you've been taught and trained that, you know, God's got you. And he does have you, but he has you so in, in this way that he's given you the ability to know him, to know his word. So when you're about ready to make it, so does everybody understand, we got to make choices. And I hope the choices you and I are making are good ones. Amen. I, I hope that they're good ones. I, I, and, 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 and so as we're making good choices, so then when you come, let's just, so now let's just shift this to like I normally do. I want to talk to you then about big decisions, maybe a career change, maybe, uh, what city are you supposed to live in? Maybe it is, you know, should I marry him or her? Maybe it is where I go to college. You know, maybe it is, uh, just anything like that. Well, if you're going to make a, a big decision, and any decision can be done this way, you have to get God's wisdom. You have to get God's wisdom. How do you get God's wisdom? Well, Proverbs 4, 7 says wisdom is the principal thing. Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. Proverbs 23, 4 says, labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. And then James 1 and 5 says what? If any man lack wisdom, let him do what? Ask of God. Now, I, in our circles, one of the things I hear people say all the time is when someone's wanting to step out in faith, I hear people say all the time, well, you better use wisdom. Well, it depends on whose wisdom you're going to use. Because if you're going to use your own, the Bible says cease from that. How many of you know um, uh, Pastor Rhonda's great revelation that she got from John Osteen, not Joel Osteen, John Osteen, is what? God is... Everybody say it. Say, God is... is. Smarter Smarter. than I am. Do you all believe that? Well, said, Pastor Mark, that's not too hard to believe. If we really believed that, though, we would do a whole lot of different stuff. If we really believe that, we would do things a whole lot different. In other words, we'd include him in on the decisions of our life. We would realize that when he says, don't do this, we'd be like, I don't understand why you don't want me to do that. But you say, don't, you don't like it. I don't like it. You love that. I really don't, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn to love it. And I'm going to, oh, by faith, I love that too. I love that. I love what you love, and I don't like what you don't like, and I hate what you hate. 
And, and that's just the way it's going to be. Because God is smarter than we are. And he, he know he has wisdom. Now, wisdom also has it with it some future things in there. When you get wisdom, it has something, you know, even like the, the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is future. And so all wisdom has to pertain something to a future because you need wisdom for future decisions. You know, one of the things, uh, y'all remember Solomon, why, why did the Lord really appreciate him so much? Because he could have, would have, he said, what do you want? And he could have asked for anything. And what he asked for? And so it, it, that should be a clue to us. That really makes God happy. That's why in James 1, 5, it says that if any man needs wisdom, let him ask not ask for it. And the King James says, and he will not abrade. In other words, uh, he's not going to, uh, the NIV says he won't find fault with you. In other words, don't think, well, I should know this. Don't get to the place where you think, I've been walking with God for 30 years. I, I shouldn't ask him about this. No, you should ask him. You should ask him, Lord, I need wisdom. Lord, I need your advice. Lord, what do you got to say about this? Lord, what do you, what do you want concerning this situation? And he will give it to you, that wisdom, without finding fault. How does that wisdom come? Well, the word of God is the wisdom of God, so he might lead you to scriptures. He might cause uh, your pastor uh, to get off on a message and say, or, or anybody around here preaching and say, well, that wasn't in my notes. A lot of times that is someone getting an answer that they've asked for. And, you know, really, I'll just teach you a little bit. You can, you can, you know, uh, th this is more like Burger King than McDonald's. You can't have it your way when you come here. All you got to do is learn how to believe God for God to answer you. Now, I haven't taught this in a long time. I, what, well, here we are. I haven't taught this in a long time. I remember when I was a traveling minister, I was really young, and I would go out and preach. And the Lord uh, told me when I went out, when I first started, he said, three or four, no more. And I'm like, what? Three or four, no more. He said, don't stay any longer than in a church, because back in those days, the traveling ministers used to stay for more than just a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. It was just a different time. And he said, three or four, no more. And, and the Lord was really using me. And I'm like, what do you mean three or four, no more? He said, you don't know enough to stay in a church any longer than four days. It's like, well, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I thought, I'd, thought I knew a little more than that. But that was 25 years ago. Looking back, I'm surprised he didn't say, don't stay longer than a service. And so um, one, just one and done. All right, get out. And uh, so, but, so, um, but I would go out and preach a lot, and my pastors were John and Michelle Grunewald, who are now Rama directors over the world. And uh, they're in station Europe, but they have Europe, North Africa, um, Middle East, um, all of Europe. Uh, and so um, I would go in, and um, so our midweek was on Thursday, and I had a 45-minute drive from my house to church. And so I would have a laundry list of questions. For the Lord, because I'd been out preaching and people would ask me questions that I didn't know the answer to. And so I had a laundry list every, every Thursday night, especially because I was traveling usually on Sunday, I had a laundry list. And so I would have the Lord, we'd be talking about this and I'd get to church and, and Michelle and John would get kind of frustrated all the time because they would be like, they couldn't hardly ever preach their sermon. But I would be with my checklist and I'd go, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'd be like, one more, one more. Come on, one more, one more. And, the, you know, so, so I made the mistake because it was a small church. There's like 30 or 40 of us. So I made the mistake of teaching everybody how to do it. <laughs> so it was, we had some wild services, but they all got their answers. So I, I don't know. It was, it was, so I want you to do it. But with all of us in the room, we could, I could never get to my message. But you know what? I'd be all right with that. If you need something from the Lord, but it doesn't always have to come from me. Sometime you'll be, you know, listening to something and the Holy Ghost will say, uh, turn on Joyce. And you'll listen to it for 10 minutes. You'll be like, oh. Or maybe Creflo. Or one of the Kenneths. Or whoever. Or could be as simple as Somebody from here will call you up and say, hey, I think about your day, blah, 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 blah. Oh, thank you. It's just, it could be, it could be, or here at church, it could be someone, you're just chatting with somebody before or after service. And, and it doesn't have to be, thus saith the Lord. 
It could just be in conversation. But how many know you need God's wisdom? So ask for it. Any big decision, any decision, but especially the big ones. Lord, I need your wisdom. God, you're smarter than I am. God, you're smarter than I am. God, you're smarter than I am. I realize that. And then a good prayer you can pray over yourself is found in Colossians chapter 1. Verse number nine, for this cause also, since we they that heard it, we do not cease to, uh, to pray for you and desire that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So you can pray that for somebody else, but you can also pray that for yourself. I, I pray that I would be filled with the knowledge of your will, Father, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And as you pray that and believe that, then wisdom will start to pop to you. You'll know what to do and how to do it. Um, so, uh, so, so, so we got to be doers of the word and we're going to get to that in a minute, but then let's just take a little minute and remind you of, you have an advantage that most Christians do not know that they have this advantage. But if you go to church here, you've heard me talk about it. Or if you've been in Bible Institute, you know about it. Uh, how many you know, one of the greatest advantages you and I have as a new Testament spirit filled believer is that we are led by the spirit of God. You have an unction. First John 5 and 10 says that you have a witness. See, how do you be led? Well, how many of you know you don't have to wait for a, a sky writing? You don't have to wait for a voice. Uh, you know, you don't need a prophecy. I said you don't need a prophecy all the time. If you ever really get a true prophecy, it's because you needed it. And what, what are you supposed to do with that prophecy? Well, the Bible says with a prophecy, you're supposed to war. <laughs> if you get a prophecy and you really need it, that means what's coming? A war. It, it's meant to hold you because it's a little tougher. And so that's why when the prophet comes, I'm like, I don't need anything, Lord. I don't need anything. Hallelujah. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. One time I heard this minister say, an angel appeared to me and told me thus and so. I was thinking, oh my goodness, you better hang on. And he did have to. Didn't realize he was going to have to. It was exciting for a minute. I just, the more spectacular the leading is, just it's for the, it, you, you need it to hold on to. But every day you can have a witness. I can promise you that. Because do you know you're born again? Everybody know you're born again? How do you know? I know. Well, because I love the brethren. That's a good answer. But really, the truth is you just know. Because a lot of times when you're ministering to somebody, you try to get them born again, and you ask them, you know, will you go to heaven when you die? And they say, I hope so. What do you know? Not born again. You see, that's like a lot of people on TV. They don't understand Christianity. They, they, you know, they talk to religious people and they try to, to do all this without the power of the Spirit of God. And, and you know, they don't understand us and they're never going to understand us because you can't understand us. You can't even understand the Bible until you're born again. I mean, the, the Word of God don't even make sense to you because it's living. And you have to have the living one on the inside of you to understand a living document. And they're trying to figure it out with their brain. And this is not a history book. This, this, is, this is the living word of God. It's bread. And so I remember one time I had this man that he came to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. And he just said to me, I don't understand that book. Well, anytime you call the Bible that book, I know we got problems. Because, you know, someone who is born again, they would call it the word, at least the Bible, but really the word. It's, it's you know. And, and so I knew from that moment that he wasn't born again. So I set out to get him born again. And I remember after he got born again, then one time I saw him again later and he smiled and he said, I understand. I understand. Because you can't understand. It's not just, it's not the King James that's confusing. It's, it's the fact that it's a living word that comes from God. And so... That, that word, living word is, is the witness on the inside of you. And salvation is no so. And so you know so. And if you can locate that, because how many, you don't, don't raise your hand. How many of you feel uh, sometimes, <laughs> uh, how am I going to say it? Well, do you always feel saved? And what I mean by that is like, woohoo all the time. You know, I don't know. Sometimes we don't. 
But the truth of the matter is, I always know. I always know. I know. I have no doubt about it. It's not a question. I know. And where is that? That's in my spirit. And that's the same place that you're led. Now listen, we're talking about making decisions. We're talking about making some choices. Because let's say you have this job that's offered to you. You don't know what to do. Do I take it? Do I not take it? Well, there's no scripture that says to do it or not do it. So you have to discern it by prayer and leading. Lord, I need wisdom. And for, oh, goodness sake, quit fleecing. I'm going to talk to somebody in this room for just a minute. You quit that. Fleecing. Y'all know what a fleece is? It is old covenant. Well, Lord, if I'm supposed to take this job, have them offer it to me. Well, today you sure wouldn't say that because they're offering people jobs without even interviewing them. Because there are more jobs than people. That's a good thing. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, or, you know, I always use this one. Lord, if the person who interviews me has a, you know, if it's going to be a woman, she has a red dress on, I'll know it, it, that it's my job. Well, maybe red's all she looks good in. And then you get working that job and it's the worst job you ever had. And then you blame God because she wore a red dress, but you figured out she's wearing red all day long every day. Well, what is, see, but that's silly, but people do that all the time. You quit fleecing God. Well, it worked for me. Well, you got lucky. Stop it. That is not what a new covenant born again believer does. Because a fleece depends on circumstance. And he needed to do that because he was old covenant. You're born again. God lives in you. You have something higher. You have something better. Come on, y'all know, y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, I'm going to correct my, uh, you know, my whatever. I'm not telling you to correct anybody. I'm telling you to quit it. And then you can lead people by showing them, you know, I don't know if you're close enough. So, I, you know, I wouldn't do it that way. I did it this way. Or you can tell them of a bad experience with that fleece and thing. Can God use something in the natural to help point you in the right direction? I'm sure he can and he does, but it's not his highest and best. I'm trying to get you up to the highest and best. And right now I got to hurry my highest and best because we're coming to the end. Hallelujah. So the truth is you and I can be led by the spirit of God. So John 10, four and five says what? That we are his sheep and we do what? Says we have to learn his voice and after we get good at learning it for a long time, then we can finally do this. No. Everybody give me a good bath. Good. When did you become a sheep? So the moment you got born again, what happens? I know his voice. If anyone's ever tried to teach you the voice of God, then that's, that's, that's not the way this works. You know it. No, I don't. Yes, you do. And quit acting like you don't. Because the Bible says you do. A lot of times when the Lord, I say it this way, the same spirit that corrects is the same spirit that directs. Now, we can all pretend when he's correcting, we don't know him. I don't know. That's not God. Because that's what we do. It's like get your spiritual remote out and change the channel. I'm sure that wasn't God. Or he's trying to tell you something to do, and he's like, I want you to go over there and give that person $200. Well, that's all I got. I'm sure that's not the Lord. I'm sure that's not the Lord. I'm sure that's not the devil. And you already said it wasn't you. Well, that by process of elimination, that must be God. A lot of times when it comes to leading and stuff, people really want something big because they don't want to miss it. But God didn't promise you something big. He promised you an unction. First John 2 and 20 says you have an unction. From, what is an unction? It's an inward knowing. If you're, all, if you're waiting for something big all the time, something that you won't miss God, you're going to miss God because you're going to talk yourself out of it. It's just an unction. It's just a knowing. But it's the same knowing as you know you're born again. People ask me all the time when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. Well, how do you know? Well, it's different for everybody. I can't teach you how I know. I can just tell you that I know because I know Him. And you can, but you can know too. 
I'm not, it, it, you know, um, when God, you, it's, it's a knowing on the inside of you and, and how you make it stronger. Um, now I'm talking a bunch of tongue talking people, um, uh, praying in tongues. People say, well, if you need to know something, just pray in tongues. Well, that's true if you believe John 10, 4 and 5 and Romans 8 and 1 John 5. But see, if you don't believe that you can hear from God praying in tongues for two hours, is all it's going to do is make you charged up like a battery and not knowing what's going on. You always have to start with Scripture. And, and, and this is a faith thing. Now, once you have believed God and you know you can be led by the Spirit of God, you can tenderize, if you will, yourself by praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in Jude 20, you build upon your most holy faith. It doesn't give you faith. It builds upon your faith. So if you don't have faith in an area, praying in tongues will not give you faith. Praying in tongues won't even quiet your mind. When you're making, come on, have you ever prayed in tongues and then you got like this parade of stuff going through your brain? And your decision has to get from your heart to your head. So one of the best ways to do it is to speak the word and divide your soul with your spirit according to Hebrews. The word of God is like a two-edged sword dividing between soul and spirit. Thoughts come from your brain, the intents of your heart. See, God, what he has for you I wish I'd have started right here. Uh, what God has for you is in your heart, not in your head. And if you're making decisions out of your head only, you're going to be messed up. And you're going to be doing a lot of repenting and need lots of miracles. But if you learn to make decisions out of your heart where God lives and where he talks to you from, he knows your future. He knows what he has for you. He knows exactly where you need to be working. He knows exactly who you need to be in relationships with. He, needs, he knows exactly what city you ought to live in. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He even knows how many you lost. He knows what's going on, but everything is in your your heart, not your head. And every one of us have to make sure that we're making decisions out of our heart, out of our born again spirit and not of our head. How do we get it there? Well, it's in here and you got to get it up here. How do I do that? I take the word to it. I got a decision to make. Um, job's just easy. Lord, you said, you know, um, I know you meet all my needs, but you know, I know if you don't work, you don't eat. And so I want to take, you know, this job, um, is this the, the place where you have decided to, uh, to place me where, uh, you're going to give me seed and my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What'd you do? You just put a double edged sword into your, into your life. And what will it do? It'll divide between the thoughts and the intents of your heart. In other words, it'll divide with what you're thinking and what God's thinking. It'll divide between what's in your head and what's in your heart. And so you can make sure what's in your heart gets also in your head. And then you'll be making decisions based on what God wants and not what you want because God knows the future. John 16, John 16, 13 says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he'll not speak himself, but he'll guide you into all truth. And he will show that word show means declare, disclose and transmit. So the one who knows tomorrow lives in you and he's declaring to you he's disclosing secret things that nobody knows and he's transmitting or downloading them to you so that you will make proper decisions because and so if you understand my word and the effect that it has on your heart and on your mind and you will take it and use it as I've directed you it will cause you to make proper decisions every day and today will be the best day and today will be a day that you will be able to rejoice because you've known my will and you've obeyed me today amen so it's important to get in our heart and get out of our head because the bible says what about you know every man's ways are right in his own mind but it's the lord who directs his steps Godly wisdom will prevail where your natural wisdom will let you down. Whose wisdom are you using? God is smarter than we are. And that's just the beginning of, you know, and then when he says it, what do you got to do? You got to do what he says. Because see, you can get it. You can ask him for wisdom. 
And then he can lead you and guide you. But then when he says something to you, So don't be afraid. Don't be in fear. Because I am your father and I will lead you and guide you into the correct place at the correct time. Trust only me. Trust in my word. You are my child and I care for you and I watch over you. So obey me fully and completely and see your salvation. Hallelujah. Because a lot of times we get into a place where God's speaking to our heart and we know it's Him and yet, ugh. Ugh, how, how, do, how do I do this? I, I, I can't figure this out. But you do have to get to a place. But see, it comes from you have to know his voice. You have to be so sure. Because you and I know people who've said, well, you know, God said. You know, and somebody's all the time saying every day, 3,000 times, God said. God said. What do you know? God didn't say. God didn't say. Now, the word, you can say the word said. The word said, you can say that 3,000 times in a day, right? But <laughs> the Lord came to me and spoke to me. And then three minutes, you know what I'm saying? I mean, just all day long, you know, anybody who's throwing that around all the time, you just got to be a little, the Lord told me you're supposed to marry me. Run! Anyway, so, um, <laughs> I saw you up on the platform. The Lord said. It. Anyway, so uh, we gotta hurry up. Um, so, glory to God. You just can't be afraid to obey because He's got you. But you just gotta know. That's where you get you spent. Get get the you know pray. You know, understand you gotta choose. Ask for wisdom. Understand that the leading comes in from here. Take the word to divide between your soul and your spirit. Believe with everything, you know, concentrate. Anytime I've got a big decision to make, even though I've been doing this for a lot of years now, I confess those scriptures, John 10, 4 and 5, John 8, 37, um, you know, um, Romans 8, uh, 14 and 16, I look at those. First John 5 and 10, I look at that. And, and I, mean, I, am a, I am your sheep. I know your voice. I know your voice. I'm not going to make a mistake because the voice of a stranger I will not follow. I know your voice. I tell people this all the time. If we were in a room, you know, and suddenly everything went, you know, completely dark and there was no way out and everybody was screaming, um, I would listen for my wife's voice. And I know her voice because I know this. When she sat down in a room, she looked at all the eggs. She's the only one on the plane who actually pulls out the thing. <laughs> Maybe some of you do too. But she, she looks, the exits are here. I'm like, okay. I'm just going to follow you. So don't tell me. I'm just going to follow you. I'm always sitting on the inside. She's like, I'm just going to follow you. So, you know, I mean, I told you when I was in Chile in the earthquake, the first thought I did, after I said, Father, I'm here, I thought, what would Rhonda do? What would Rhonda do? What would Rhonda do? <laughs> so I heard her voice, put on your shoes, get your wallet, and put your clothes on. Anyway, so uh, that's what I did. <laughs> other, other men in that hotel needed their wives. Let's just say that. And so... Um, Anyway, but so my point is, I love all of you, but I know her. I trust you all, some of you, somewhat, but I really trust her because I know her. Now, just the opposite. I don't think she would listen for my voice in a, in a state of emergency because <laughs> she knows I haven't looked. It's funny. Anyway, so, uh, so do you know his voice? Confess that you do. Believe that you do. And then when he says it, just like the first miracle, what did Mama Mary say? Whatever he says, do it. But see, you got to know what he said. You got to know what's written, and you got to know what's in your heart. And you can't be afraid to obey it, and you just got to do it. And it will always work out. Always. Why? He's not a man that he should lie. 
What's the key? The key is you knowing for sure. And I know that's the sticking point. Because the devil then will try to talk you out of it. Well-meaning people will come to try to talk you out of it. Tell the story real quick. Now, this is ministry story because that's my life, not necessarily your life. But that's my life. I was an accountant, you all know that, and I was doing very well working my dream job in my hometown. Um, I had uh, applied to go to Rama to Bible school and not told a whole lot of people, uh, but those that I trusted, and I began to tell them. And um, a couple, few things happened, and because I'm talking about a big decision in my life. So this is, you know, in the 90s, early, um, I, I, this little Methodist boy got filled with the Holy Ghost, learning the Word of God, realized he had a call of God on his life, and I've got to go to Bible school. Somebody gave me a book called Understanding the Anointing. I turned it over, the Spirit of God, and back then I didn't know too much about the Spirit of God. He said, I want that man to train you. And Brother Hagin's picture was on it. I didn't know who that man was. But that's what the Lord spoke to me. And, and I didn't really understand the speaking, but it was really strong because I didn't understand what I've been teaching you. So the Holy Ghost said that to me. So I began to tell people. And so one of the things uh, in the little church I was going to is uh, one of the persons said to me, you can't go to that school. You'll get a rhema spirit. And meaning it's a bad school. Don't go there. And so I had three or four of those. Then my pastor even, bless his heart, he said the same thing. And then um, as I'm getting the, I'm scheduled to turn in my notice to the company, to the accounting firm that I'm working for. That was my dream job in high school. I'm telling you, it was my dream job. That's what I wanted. The day before the partner, you know, in in a CPA firm, you have all these partners who are, and so the partner comes in, he sits across from my desk and he said to me, Mark, if you keep doing what you're doing, one day you will be a partner, which was my dream of all dreams, in this firm. I smiled within, laughed a little bit, and thought, that was a good try. And so the next day I resigned. But what happened before that to give me the courage is a little a, a lady who didn't know me very well, the Lord had spoken something to my heart that would come to pass in the ministry if I obeyed him. And I don't really tell people about it, and I'm not going to tell you about it. It was very specific, very personal. But this woman, on a Sunday morning, came up to me, and it, it wasn't, ha, thus says the Lord. It was a casual conversation, but it was word for word from the Lord. Not the preacher. Of course, not, not, not the prophet, a lady who I loved and trusted, who didn't know, casually said the exact words from the Lord. I'm telling you, he'll help you. He will help you. You say, well, can you promise me a word like that? No. But I'm just telling you, when it comes to stuff like that, the Lord will go out his way to help you. All right, it's really been a good night, but we're way past. Go home. 